thank you all so much for having me. I'm really excited to uh, be here for the Waste Free Imagine Conference. I, uh, I'm going to be logging off right after I'm done and heading back home to get uh, to my cocktail uh, set up, and hopefully I'll be able to rejoin you all for the uh, happy hour gathering. So if we don't quite get to all your questions or whatever now, uh, we can chat during the happy hour, and otherwise you can find me on the internet. I'm on the internet. Maybe you are too. Okay, so uh, I'm really excited to be here, and let's get started. So when you give a public talk, people always give you this advice that is, we all know what it is, right? It's to imagine that your audience is naked. And well, even though we're all online, uh, you know, the same kind of nerves can exist for giving a public talk. And well, I'm not going to imagine you naked, but I am going to imagine you uh, in a world without farmers. And it uh, turns out it's not very different after all. Without farmers, you'd be hungry, naked, and sober. And so that's the topic today, and let's dive right in. Our local farmers are so much more for us than just clothing, food, and booze. They are a critical part of our rural communities. We're a resilient economic engine. For example, when a brewer buys hops from me at my hop farm, 90% of that money stays in the state, whereas comparatively, if they buy it from outside of state, only 10% of the money stays in the state. So we're a very important, res resilient economic engine. And that means a lot. That means dollars for our schools. It means butts and pews. It means shoppers at the grocery store. It means post offices. Um, rural, America, it, rural America's vibrancy is based on the vibrancy and the number of family farms in their communities. And of course, they are our number one stewards of the land. We're all here today talking about greed and sustainability. Farmers are on the front line of that every single day. So this quote from Alda Leopold, that land as a community is the basic concept of ecology, but that land is to be loved and respected is an extension of ethics. Now, this is something that all of our farmers know. We know that farmers are on the front line when it comes to water quality and when it comes to climate change and that they can be a huge part of the solution, oftentimes with support from technology like what Breitbart provides. So local farmers are awesome. They're great even, they're excellent, um, they're fantastic. Uh, they're all sorts of superlatives, but without our help, unfortunately here in America, the family farm uh, is going away because the trends in agriculture are quite dire. The average age of a farmer in uh, America is old, 58.3 uh, to be exact, uh, which is very old to, to compare it to another important public profession teaching, the average age of a teacher in America is 42. And that's considered a little bit old uh, because that means in a handful of years, those people will be ready for retirement. But it's not even just that farmers are 58.3 on average, 33% of American farmers are 65 years of age or older. Now, this is an interesting demographic for a million ways and not the least of which right now in an election year, you see a sea of red outside of the um, urban uh, and, and kind of city areas. Well, a lot of people out here are very old and, and we know that the tendencies in the older demographics are to vote more red. So interesting piece that all of our farmers are 33%, 33% of our farmers are older than 65, which means if it was a normal kind of job, they would all be retiring you know, tomorrow. Um, so on this slide, we're gonna talk about uh, how many farmers we've lost. And then on the next one, we're gonna learn about how many farmers under the age of 30 America added. So this slide represents the number of farmers we lost. We lost 100,000 farmers from 2012 to 2017 in America. The next slide, and see if you can catch the difference when it comes around. Did you see it? Do you see it? It's in the upper left corner. A very small little white bar went up. That's how many farmers under the age of 30 we added. We only added a, roughly 1,000 young farmers in that same time period that we lost 100,000. It doesn't, do, it doesn't require you know, a, math, a math wizard to realize that we are rapidly running out of farmers and we are not replacing them. As a fun little aside, I'm one of the thousand counted in that tiny little corner on, on your screen. And as I mentioned, I'll be around later if you want any uh, uh, autographs or anything like that. <laughs> Okay, so why are all of our farmers are old and we're losing a bunch of them? And why, why might that be? Um, here's a good reason, prices. 
So we're going to play kind of a Price is Right game uh, rhetorically, of course, since we can't actually talk to each other. Right now. Um, this is the average price for a gallon of milk in America, $4.49. Um, this next number is how much a farmer gets out of that, $1.32. Uh, and that's before they pay labor and utilities and inputs. That's not just you know your paycheck. So let's go on to the next one, bread. $3.49 is the average retail price for a two pound uh, loaf of bread in America. And the farmer's share is 12%, 12 cents, uh, not very much. Um, okay, one last, one last example, but I think we understand the trends, right? Beer, near and dear to my heart as a beer farmer, uh, $8.99 is the retail price of an average six pack in America. And the farmer's cut is just, 15 cents. I wish that number were higher as someone who farms, by the way. And yeah, just a reminder that this is not just a challenge for our rural communities. Of course, without farmers, you'd be hungry, naked, and sober, as we discussed earlier, and I hope we understand at this point. Um, but it's this is not just a rural problem. It's, an, it's for urban communities. This isn't just a farmer problem. It's an all of us problem, because we all have to work together to get this accomplished, to get this to work. So what do we do about it? How can we build a better for, for how can we build a better food system for our farmers? First, we're going to consider the sustainability or the green movement or whatever you want to call it. All of us on this uh, at this conference are wildly familiar with this. Brightmark is an example of just how far a movement can go. So way back at the beginning of the sustainability movement, roughly speaking, in America was the 60s with the hippies and we were all planting trees. Um, we were planting trees, we were learning about recycling, but fast forward to today, in a short matter of time, it's everything. It's Brightmark, it's international climate policy, it's national issues around elections. Climate and sustainability and the green movement are a part of our, each and every one of our day-to-day -day lives. You're thinking about recycling, you're thinking about composting, you're thinking about investing in renewable energy. However, you compare that then to where we're at with the food system and the food movement, we haven't gotten very far. If you're familiar though, I mean, you've certainly heard of it. You might've read Michael Pollan's things or anywhere other kind of things like that. You know, Michael Pollan and the idea is vote with your fork. So you go to the local supermarket, you go to the farmer's market and you buy local stuff or you buy organic stuff or you buy, you know, stuff with slightly better qualities than just being a straight up commodity. But in order to make the change we need to do, simply buying local strawberries isn't gonna do it. In order to do that, we have to move beyond voting with our fork and begin to vote with our vote. We have to take those dollars and then also bring them to the ballot box. Again, could, you know, rather uh, good timing for this talk, depending on how you think about it. So again, that might sound like redundant or obvious that to make policy change, we need to invest in policy actions. Um, but the food movement's not made that connection. If you, those of you who have been in the sustainability movement for your, for your careers, you can see, you can think about how 10 years ago, what it looked like, 20 years ago, what it looked like. The food movement is at that nascent stage. You know, we're X years old. We're less than 10 years old at this point in America. We have a lot of growing to do. Our problems are much bigger than what we can accomplish with farmers markets alone. But the good news is we can do stuff about it. We can connect and listen and listen to farmers attend talks like mine. Uh, listen to farmers, talk to your farmer neighbors, listen to farm advocates, fight for fair prices, which looks like quotas and supply management, guaranteed prices for farmers, fight for fair and open trade so that farmers can get the best price for their products, regardless of political uh, talky talk, let's say, uh, and engage with your reps and your candidates at the local, state, and federal level. Involving them and building food issues into their platforms is how we bring these problems to light and we can get actual solutions that will make a meaningful, scalable impact. And the good news is uh, you can do this. It has been done. There is success out there. For example, the guy in the silly hat there in the middle, you might recognize him. He and a bunch of other young farmers, it was me, by the way, it was me the whole time. Uh, he and a bunch of other young farmers passed a historic first in the country tax credit called the beginning farmer tax credit here in Minnesota. It gives an incentive for existing landowners to sell to the next generation. And that's being modeled now replicated across the country and it's coming to a federal level near you soon. 
But of course, uh, not everyone uh, agrees with me and that's totally fine. There's skeptics out there. Maybe this is what you're looking right now on your video camera. You're just like, oh, Eric, I don't know. Well, I, I, I understand the skepticism. I mean, look, there is a benefit to financial efficiency when it comes to scaling and when it comes to food. Our food is wildly cheap here in America. But I think it's very important that we consider as a, as a population, as a society, and as political structures, what those implications are. So back in the 80s or 90s, our food policy in America changed from something that was uh, a little bit more farmer friendly, or at least had a little bit more far shared power to something that was known as get big or get out. And what get big or get out means is maximize efficiency at all costs. And where that has got us to is the idea is now is that farmers have become a cost to be minimized. What happened was it used to be it took six cows to support a family on the land. And now it's about 6,000 cows in my area. And what that means is when you have a hundred uh, farmers with six cows, you have a ton of butts in the pews, you have a ton of folks going to the grocery stores, you have support for the roads and the schools, so you have tax dollars. When you got one family with 6,000 cows and a ton of hired hands, it's not the same. That doesn't create culture. It loses, we lose the culture in agriculture. And then eventually you're gonna end up in a spot where you're hungry, naked and sober. The policy got us here and policy can get us out. America's farmers are only getting older, fewer and poorer, but together we can create a solution that leads us to more vibrant rural communities, plenty of food, clothing and booze. And of course, our best stewards of the land will be stronger. So let's fight for our farmers. We can do it, we are doing it. We must take the next step with the food movement and bring it in the direction of the green and sustainability movements. So we can have those same successes. So now you know what I'm gonna say, maybe on this final slide, but so say it with me at home, if you wish, uh, we'll be able to hear you. So you, you know, you can get off the hook. So it's not just about voting with your fork, which to be clear, continue to do. What you, we all should be doing is voting with our vote. All right, thank you. And I think we have time for questions if I'm not mistaken. We do. If there are any questions for Eric, please feel free to drop them in the chat window. Um, and Eric, while we wait for maybe a few questions to come in, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about your farm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, up until very recently, I was farming hops uh, at a farm called Mighty Axe Hops. Uh, hops are the main ingredient in your beer. Uh, and we had a, a commercial hop farm operation here in Minnesota. Uh, that's the fields of hops behind me. I see the uh, well, we're gonna, I'm going to run through these rapid fire and in the order that they show up so that we can try to get everyone. So Tina asked, how did I get into farming? I got into farming because I really wanted to live a life that was aligned with my values. I, I'm, a, I'm a millennial who wants to change the world or whatever we, we all want to do. And actually 75% of young farmers in America did not actually grow up on farms. I didn't grow up on a farm. Most young people getting into egg did not grow up on farms. So it's an interest kind of demo change that's really affecting how we think about managing, governing, and the policy around supporting people in this industry. Uh, my favorite IPA is, you know, the one in my hand, uh, which is, I don't actually, this is water, uh, but, you know, I don't have an exact favorite. It changes all the time. I really like IPAs though that feature unique, distinct hop flavors. I'm not, I'm kind of bored with all the like hazy IPA stuff. So uh, not Citro, not Simcoe, not Mosaic, that stuff kind of boring that we've had a million beers like that flavor profile. Um, my farmer friends think about uh, digesters and stuff. Uh, farmers uh, like them. Uh, the issue is the cost of them. Um, I'm actually on a, a rural finance authority, which is a state bonding and loan uh, kind of entity here in Minnesota. And we have a specific methane and biodigester uh, loan program that, can, that we can partner with a local bank and really make it affordable interest rate for the farmer. So uh, familiar with that. Uh, I do not sell beer, but I do sell hops to people who make beer. And on our website at Mighty Axe Hops, you can see a list of what's available. Given the contraction, the number of farmers has average farm size increased. Yes, uh, acres farmed overall in America hasn't meaningfully gone down significantly, but what's happened is we've lost a ton of farmers and the farmers that are left have run higher and higher average acres. Uh, and that's kind of that consolidation means an emptying of rural America as if there's one guy farming the entire county instead of a hundred guys from the entire county, guys or gals, uh, which in farming is mostly guys, which is a huge, another challenge we have. Um, but like, you know, 
you get the picture. That's not a lot of people left. Uh, great job starting your garden, Sarah. Highly recommend more people start gardens. It's wildly rewarding. And if you do your best, some days you'll be able to get an apple from your garden. Eric, I got your DM. I'll respond to that later. He asked more about the tax credit. <laughs> what drives me to overcome the issues that are faced as a farmer? Uh, it's wildly overwhelming. Um, my wife also farms. She has a separate farm business than I do, but we live on the same home farm and it's very tough sometimes. Um, but there's enough beauty in it um, to keep you going. That's what I think. How are we adapting and implementing solutions for climate change? Uh, you can see in the field behind me, I've got a ton of cover crop coming up between our rows. We do a lot of active cover cropping, um, but ultimately uh, we had a huge storm that took apart a lot of our, a lot of our, a lot of our crop last year. And that, you know, might have been climate change influenced. How do I identify small farmer friendly policymakers, politicians from Clark? Clark, that's the million dollar question. It's very hard. In fact, up until this last presidential and presidential nominating uh, season, uh, the issues that farmers are facing in farm economics were not even a part of presidential debates. So we're seeing a little bit of a light shine into this corner of, of egg policy. It used to be before red and blue kind of voted the same. Uh, when they were elected on issues of policy. Um, but it's very hard. There's not a party, there's the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, neither of them have a very different or distinct uh, platforms when it comes to egg policy. Is there a country that's doing farming the best? That way we could model there, says Lucy, asks Lucy. I don't know, Lucy. Um, every country, farming is such an interesting, you know, agriculture, and so much of farming is an expression of culture. Um, in my opinion, I really like the, um, protections that a lot of EU countries have put in place around Parmesan or Champagne or East Kent Goldings, which are hops that are a Golding hop gold, grown in East Kent. No one else can sell their hops as East Kent Goldings. I think those kind of protections of protecting unique flavors and expressions of a place are wildly valuable at protecting those from just being farmed out to a million, um, you know, a million acres and destroying the craft and the culture behind that. So I think there's a lot of value to that. Um, ultimately. The rule of thumb is we want to support policies and policymakers who support policies that add that will enable more people to be on the landscape. At the end of the day, if you can sit down and look at a policy or talk to a farmer or a representative and say, I want you to support policies that at the end of them lead to more people on the landscape, not less. That is a moniker that that's a measuring stick that I use when I look at policies and I talk to policy folks. That's my moniker and it's it's an interesting. It's an interesting measuring stick because most things don't necessarily get there. It's kind of the opposite of our mentality of get bigger, get out, right? What kind of tools are younger farmers like you using that more established farmers aren't using from Patrick? Um, I'd imagine that younger farmers are better at direct marketing because we're better at understanding the ways of social media, um, although that's changing. Um, I don't know, I mean, I think the biggest thing is just your mindset going into it. So if you farmed for 70 years, you're not about to turn everything on a dime, but if you're coming into it new or with some new ideas, you probably have a better opportunity to say like pivot to more organic production or to a different local market with better margins. I don't know how much more time we have, Savannah, et cetera, let well, me know. You know, you're, you're, we're doing great on time. And I did notice that you didn't answer one of the questions. People uh -oh. want to know where you got your great hat. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I, did I even see that? Gosh, I can't believe I missed it. Um, yeah, my hat is, uh, uh, you can just get it online. It's a Minnetonka moccasins, which don't let the name fool you. It's definitely made in China. If anyone has a uh, American uh, source of American leather, all leather hat uh, that's in this style, please let me know because this one is actually kind of breaking and I need a new one and I'm trying to find a, a American and American grown uh, leather. So. Uh, all right. That's what well, you guys can do for me. That would be great. Well, thank you, Eric, for your valuable insights and for joining us today. We're so grateful to have you. Um, again, if anyone has any additional questions for Eric, please feel free to contact him directly at ericrsanarud at gmail.com. It's there on your screen. And Eric, any final thoughts? No, thanks a lot for having me. I'll uh, stick around just for a second in the chat and uh, give to as many as I can. All right, sounds good. Thank you again.